First of all, I just want to say thank you all for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, my name is Stephen Bridges. I'm an associate curator here at the museum. And I couldn't be more thrilled with the program that we have this evening. Um, joining me, it's, it's actually quite a humbling experience to be joined by our three guests that we have here tonight, uh, especially Ketrin Sigurdotter, the artist who are featuring the main floor of the exhibition, or the main floor of the museum here. Um, thank you, Ketrin, for returning and sharing uh, your work with us. I'd also like to welcome Hesse McGraw, who is curator at El Dorado, uh, which is a urban design architectural and curatorial practices firm based out of Kansas City. I get that more or less right. Yeah. yeah okay. And Anya Sirota, who is an associate dean of academic initiatives, associate professor uh, of architecture at the University of Michigan, and an architectural designer. So part of my interest this evening um, was to bring Hesse and Anya in conversation uh, with Ketrin, to allow Ketrin to talk a little bit about her work, but also have these two uh, individuals who share an interest in architecture as well as the arts, curatorial practices, and design to help kind of discuss and talk around uh, Ketrin's practice and, and hopefully tease out some other threads. So I will play the part of moderator, but I think there's quite a bit to be said amongst them, so we'll see how the conversation develops organically. We are going to frame the conversation around kind of three subject matters, three topics that are, are specifically germane to Ketrin's work, uh, memory and the built environment, chance and intentionality in the creative process, and cycles of change and transformation. And within that, we'll talk about uh, the projects you'll see in the exhibition, if you haven't seen already. Uh, we'll have some images as reference um, and use those topics as a way to kind of frame the conversation moving forward. So with that, I think we'll dive right in. Sound good? Yeah. But maybe I can actually maybe join me all in welcoming our yes. guests. Yeah. <laughs> And my bike, my mic says low battery already, so <laughs> sorry, hopefully we can get that switched out. Um, I'm going to proceed uh, regardless. Um, so, Ketchum, I want to start with you. Memory uh, obviously plays a significant role in your work, and certainly it features prominently in the exhibition that we have here at the NSU Road. In the past, we've talked about memory and also history as being almost a material in your practice alongside other more traditional sculptural materials like resin and plaster, um, clay, and these other kind of things. But I want to talk a little bit about memory and I, and I hope that you'll share some, share some insights with us about the place of memory within your practice and within your creative process and specifically perhaps um, how it relates to this project called Metamorphic, um, which occupies one of the galleries in the museum. Oh, it's not so well. I, I'm not even sure. Is it it's, I think it's un, I, yeah, if you unmute it. Yeah. Get that green light. There you yeah. go. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> can you hear me? Thank you, Stephen, uh, for the introduction. And um, I'm very pleased to be back here. And wonderful to see both of you, meet you for the first time, and, and see you again. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've talked about memory as being kind of like the building material or the the real sort of material that I sculpt with, you could say, uh, of my um, of my work, uh, rather than you know, rather than a material. I'm not really materially specific, but you know, the common thread through all of my work is is kind of um, I think has to do with. Uh, constructing the past and you know I like to say construct 
deconstruction of the past and not necessarily reconstruction of the past because reconstruction implies that there that there is a previous that there is a prior construction and I think uh, there's perhaps a um, a way to you know reason <laughs> that 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 might be sort of a a problematic assumption. Mm. And um, this work, Metamorphic, is almost, um, it's a very literal construction of the past. Mm -hmm. And past that is being constructed over and over and over again, you could mm -hmm. say. Uh, it came originally about through a project that um, Hesse and I did together in, at the San Francisco Art Institute, which is my alma mater, the school that I went to uh, when I first came to the United States. And um, it, the premise of the show was basically to uh, do a project where I would be collaborating with students at the school. So I'm, um, I came first to um, the United States in 1988 or 1987, I believe, as an exchange student. Um, then I ended up uh, becoming uh, a regular student and then you know, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> history. <laughs> My favorite subject. And, and um, so I decided to um, start the project in San Francisco based on a school assignment that I got in the first week of, um, of, uh, of, of school there, which was to basically, um, and I thought that it would be interesting if I would kind of go through this assignment and ask the students to do the same, to kind of create this kind of uh, level field between me and the students. Me, of course, having been a student at the school. So it's, it's that also kind of, I think, plays into what we're going to talk about later, about mm -hmm. cycles, of, of, uh, mm -hmm. cycles of time, cycles of change. And so the, the, the assignment that I picked, that I got in the first week at the school, was to describe a room, which again, you know, right there we are constructing the past. It's describing a room from, from memory, mm -hmm. in a sense. So the work is based on uh, the sculptures in, the, in, in this um, in this work are based on a uh, sculptures and I'm um, sorry uh, furniture and objects in the room that in in a room in the house that I grew up in, and the floor piece is then um, based on drawings and photographs that the students um, had shared with me. Uh, these were all uh, international students that they had shared with me from the homes that they came from. <clears throat> and the title of the work is Metamorphic, um, and that kind of refers to it refers to a geological phenomenon, which is of uh, which is about you know rocks that kind of change in internally or intrinsically. And um, so, marble, for example, is a is a rock that that changes through mm -hmm. friction and through movement. And these objects are originally made as plaster, kind of as plaster copies, so as kind of pictures or representations mm -hmm. of actual furniture. Then they're put in crates, and each time they move, they shatter. Mm -hmm. So they, so mm -hmm. the, this form, this construction is kind of leveled. Mm -hmm. And then when the crate is opened, the construction mm -hmm. of the past mm -hmm. begins. And then it's exhibited, then it goes back into a crate, it shatters again. And then the construction of the past is begun again. So every time my job is to kind of bring the work back to um, this um, form that I remember. Mm -hmm. And in the process, there is a material um, replacement. Mm -hmm. So the white plaster, which is the material of the copy, is changed out for the, uh, for the more sort of resilient, permanent material. Mm -hmm. So 
the work goes from being just sort of a picture of a room that is somewhere else to becoming an actual actual objects, potentially functional objects that are here and not there. Right. So I want to, uh, you referenced this project in a way started in San Francisco, both with your initial study there, but then again with uh, the invitation from Hesse to, um, to come back and think of a project. So Hesse, I, I would like to hear from you a little bit more about um, your experience with developing the work with Kajrin originally, and I have here on the screen some images of that original installation as it existed in San Francisco, that was 2017, but also because the work is intended to move, to travel, um, I'd be curious to hear your impressions of the installation here too, now that you've seen yeah. both. I haven't seen both, so uh, yeah, your impressions of, of how that, um, yeah, what's different, what's the same, kind of your impressions. Well, it's amazing to be here, and thank you. It's it's great to be with the work again, mm -hmm. and you know, I think maybe to talk through that process. Mm -hmm. For me, the work was so much more about anticipation than about memory. I didn't have the memory of it wasn't my home, right. um, but I, I think from the moment that that Katrin proposed the idea we knew that the work would move through um, these kind of state changes. So mm -hmm. the process began in Iceland, the, the copies were made, they shipped to New York, they, they broke and were reconstructed. But in each moment we were doing, you know, video chats. So I, although I wasn't seeing the work in person, I was sort of seeing in the background and <laughs> we try to like, look at the margins of the videos, <laughs> the video chat to get a glimpse. And um, I think by the time the work arrived in San Francisco and gone through a few transformations, but there was a point where I felt like I already knew it. I, I already knew the work. And yet I think when you experience it in person, at least for me, there, there was actually a flood of emotion um, around the, the kind of sense of loss and um, you know the way that the objects are really invested with meaning and care uh, in the same way that our lives are about reconstruction in so many cases. So now to be here um, and to see slight shifts in the objects is really special. It's uh, you know I think also the the way that the work inhabits this space is quite different than the way that it inhabited the sort of brutalist architecture of, of the 1969 building at SFAI. Um, it has a different weight, a different kind of buoyancy. Um, the work is, is luminous in, in both locations, but the way that it holds the building is, is different. So, um, it's good to be home again. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Anya, I wanted to ask you, thinking about this project and thinking about memory in the built environment, uh, this you know around the idea of residues and traces that are often left behind or embedded in architecture or embedded in objects in this case, mm -hmm. um, and often through the different uses or in habitations. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, your impressions of the role of memory in Ketrin's work, um, as well as, you know, how it relates to your own work that often deals with the memory of place mm -hmm. as well. Sure. I mean, f first, thanks for inviting me to this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen K Katrina's work before, but to see it in person is quite different. Um, there's um, an impossibly delicious erotic quality about it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's great to see it. Um, there's something for an architect about patina mm. that's very important um, because it has an authenticating quality. It's something that's very difficult to design with. Um, and so often architects that work with an existing condition with the traces of memory, they have a very hard time representing what a novel interpretation of an installation on top of a patinaed location might look like. And we often stay away from it from that kind of representation. 
um, because it's so difficult to translate um, the sentiment of, of how that works. Um, but at the same time, it's amazing to see a work of, of art that um, understands that the, the authenticating quality of that patina is also constructed, that it doesn't bring you back to an original point, that's the truth of a particular matter, but it keeps cyclically tracing an impossible desire. And in this case, it's not nostalgic, and it's not utopian, it's something else. Um, and so there's something very, very powerful about that in the work for me. Um, in my own practice, uh, we're always trying to point to the impossibility of getting to an originary point. We often think about our you know, aesthetic project as somehow being hauntological, where it suggests that there are lots of histories that are coexisting in a particular project or object. And um, if someone can't read the original signifier, it's not that important as long as they have a feeling or a sentiment about a desire for a return. Um, that's, that's pretty good. That's already good enough. <laughs> so, yeah. Something you said, uh, Hesse, also reminded me of something we've discussed before, Ketchin, I'm going a little bit off script, so mm -hmm. hopefully bear with me, but um, the idea of Theseus' ship, um, yeah. and also I think plays into the idea of mm -hmm. the original and the copy, mm -hmm. um, but I think it also ties into identity as well. Uh, oftentimes, mm -hmm. furniture takes on this very anthropomorphic quality, right? The way that we talk about furniture is having back and legs and feet and things like that. We talk about it as if it, they're bodies. Um, and I'm going in a number of different directions here simultaneously, but um, there's a quality, quality of this work, a psychological aspect of this work that I think does have to do with, uh, about ourselves, the way that we carry ourselves through life, the ways in which we break and mend and then kind of recuperate. And, but that those fractures or those fissures are exactly who we are to a lot of degree. And I think um, there's a kind of honesty to the work in that regard, a kind of, of not just, you know, making visible that, but also kind of um, celebrating is not the right word, but valuing that to some capacity. There really isn't a question there, but if you have any thoughts. Yeah, that, no, I mean, it's, uh, it is sort of exposing the true nature of, the object and you know, mm -hmm. what happens to the object, which um, I don't know if there's much more. I mean, maybe that's just um, a way to kind of complete the sentence mm -hmm. that it's not, I mean, you were talking about patina, and patina, of course, is a natural, um, something that usually naturally is naturally produced, and it's kind of the evidence of time on the surface. Mm -hmm. But, you know, then there's also this kind of inherent uh, change that happens in the object, which, um, you know, I've done several other sculptures uh, with plaster, and, um, and you know, often I really polish the, the, the surface so that it becomes very, very smooth, and, you know, that's when I started to really pay attention to the fact that, you know, even if, you know, this material or the surface is so smooth, it is still the inherent surface that is also in the middle of the object. Mm. It's not, the object doesn't have this sort of covering that, you know, tells one story and then if you scratch it, there's another story underneath. And so I'm, I may be in a, some, in a certain way striving to, to be um, just completely forthcoming with the nature mm -hmm both the nature of the object and the material and the story of it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just say that. So, moving more into the realm of talking about chance and intentionality within the creator process, which is something that carries through all of the projects in the exhibition. Uh, you know, I've with the images kind of highlighting the unbuilt residences series, but certainly this applies to, to all the work. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, part of the impetus for me 
in putting these three uh, these three projects together for this exhibition was in a way tracing uh, what I saw as a kind of relationship between them, specifically around this working methodology, where you are thinking very consciously about the role of chance and intentionality, intentionality within the creative process. Um, but I want to I want to hear from you a little bit. How did you arrive at working in this way? Um, knowing that oftentimes inviting chance into your process is also kind of relinquishing a certain amount of control to a degree. Right. Um, and what does that mean for you to do that, to make work that allows for that to happen? Um, and in particular, perhaps using the unbuilt residences as an example, you know, that can give some ground to, to what that means and what that looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think actually the unbuilt uh, residences are a good, uh, are a perfect way to introduce that or, or talk about the origins of this mm -hmm. process. So the the earliest work in the show is from 2005, and mm -hmm. it's one of these uh, one of these houses. And there was a, a friend in Iceland who brought to my attention this. Um, collection from the archive of the Architectural Association in Reykjavik uh, of houses that were designed between 1920 and 1930 that had not been built mm -hmm. for various reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, and I really, and I mean, this is very often the case that, you know, when I start making these sculptures, I'm sort of, it's just a, a completely experimental pr process that mm -hmm. I really don't necessarily know. I, I sort of, I do when I make and I make decisions and it kind of all kind of um, is developed very, um, you know, just very organically, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so um, now kind of the narrative that I tell about these works as a group is not necessarily the narrative that I begin with. Mm -hmm. And in that way, I probably work very differently from, you know, the architects that designed these houses, for example, which, you know, make the drawing with the intention of it functioning a certain way. And, and you know, the intention is there kind of before the, before the design. And so... Uh, the first work um, was really sort of um, it was me kind of kind of solving the problem of how to take these old limited drawings, drawings that were quite limited in kind of the information they gave me to make a model, and then coming up with a way to actually construct them into something akin to a scale model, but not really a real mm -hmm. scale model, more of a sort of a, almost like a look and feel or like a mm -hmm. mood board or, you know, something <laughs> like that for, and, um, and then I decided, you know, once I had kind of constructed this object, I took it to the roof of the building where my studio was at the time, and I took it and I threw it off the roof. And I, this was just sort of, you know, this idea of, um, I've always been interested in, <laughs> also kind of this conflation of scales, you know, the real scale, the full scale, the architectural scale and the miniature scale. So to actually take the miniature house and throw it off the roof of the real house, you know, and kind of, you know, wedding together these two scales in this kind of cataclysmic event, what I thought was kind of fun. <laughs> and, and yeah. then, you know, from that point, you know, I then decided to kind of reconstruct it as a way to also sort of memorialize this act. Mm. Then, uh, you know, the next three pieces I made, I made in 2008, and then I made a few more in 2012, and then the final three in 2015. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so there is quite a bit of time sort of in between for reflection, for, you know, what this what this act means and, you know, in the process of many times having to kind of describe and, and, and explain why I would do this, you know, why I would destroy a sculpture that I've just made, you know. Mm -hmm. And that has made me think a lot about, like, kind of the value that we give to different processes of change, mm -hmm. you know. 
and uh, and it may I reflect I've been reflecting on you know in the creative process how you know these transformations when you know you paint something on a canvas or or you do make a drawing and then you erase it you know and then you there's another drawing that's made on top of it mm -hmm. all of these traces and this history is all somehow in there mm. you know and and you know the just this kind of spectrum of change between something that you call creation and something you call destruction mm -hmm. you know and how you can then really question that and then you know also coming to see and learn and understand how um, you know there are aesthetics aesthetic systems where there is an allowance for this type of uh, change, erosion, mm -hmm. uh, and generally just my experience as an artist, you know, I am always, I'm constantly running into problems. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, how do these problems and how do these kind of collisions become uh, a source of, of new information and new knowledge? Mm -hmm. And mm. so, um, you know, it all begins in this unbuilt series, and then it just kind of has kind of proliferated into these other two projects and mm -hmm. this exhibition. Yeah. So, Anya, I want to talk a little bit, not entirely uh, shifting gears, but focusing more on the idea of intentionality and also thinking about this idea of scenography. Uh -huh. um, you know, the staging of Ketchin's work is very, you know, obviously well considered. It's not <laughs> haphazard no. or random by any means, uh, as you can see in, in both of the projects that we've looked at so far. Um, but thinking about sonography as this kind of synthesis between a specific context and the display of objects and materials um, in order to create a kind of heightened experience of that place. Um, sonography is usually uh, or is perhaps more commonly used within the realm of theater or mm -hmm. theatricality. Um, and I don't think that really plays so much in here, but certainly I think, especially with metamorphic, one could talk about a certain drama, uh, especially as the light changes over the course of a day. Maybe we can go there or not. But um, I'd love to hear you know, your thoughts a little bit, knowing that sonography, I think, is something that's important to you in the way that you approach your work and kind of your impressions of that within Ketchum's work and sure. I mean I there's nothing I love to discuss more than sonography. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Perfect. <great. Okay>. <laughs> but um, I wonder if we if we could go back also Absolutely. to this idea of a model. Oh yeah. Um, because for for someone trained in architecture, this is what we really geek out over. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a strange scale that you're using. It's almost an uncomfortable scale. Um, you know, a model is something that's supposed to trigger desire for a future possibility in the architectural language. You build a model so that somebody wants it, and someone is supposed to want it one-to-one -one in the future. And that's why we sort of, we build models. And um, in our practice, we're always uh, super interested in, say, building what, what we produce when we build one-to-one. -one. And if we begin to think about all the spaces that we're in as models for a kind of alternate ideology. Like, we're in a model right now. We're in an architectural model. It's built one-to-one. -one. And it tells a story of some kind of um, project, idea, ideal, politic. We're always in it. And I think, I mean, what's so striking about this um, series of models is that by destroying them and rebuilding them, they're also now one-to-one. Right. which mm. is amazing. So we go from something that's almost like an awkward dollhouse scale that makes architects uncomfortable <laughs> to um, the monumentalization of, of uh, the artifact in a completely different uh, world and language, and that's pretty exciting. Mm. Um, but, and then, in addition, <laughs> they're, they're set out scenographically, and um, this, this idea of the scenography is also... Um, quite liberating for, for architects um, and for, for our practice in, in particular. 
So it's, it's this idea that we inhabit a stage set and we aren't just users uh, of architecture, we're <laughs> actors that are performing in a particular way. Mm -hmm. And when architecture or the art object renders that explicit, it makes us conscientious of the fact that this isn't quite normal. You know, it's not normal for us necessarily to sit in this configuration and have certain social tropes that are played out because of the way the space is set up, because mm -hmm. we have these TED Talk <laughs> mics. There are certain, certain social uh, norms that are, that are set out. If we're conscientious of our scenographic constructs, if we understand the, the art object um, as being constructed, as uh, appealing to our desire to perform in the world, then somehow we're liberated yeah. of the, the kind of um, pressures of, um, of acting naturally. Uh, we get to reconstruct our identities again and again, and, and there's, a, there's a pleasure to that. Yeah. And so seeing the projects set up in this truly scenographic order, um, there's a liberating quality to the way they're installed. And I wish I had seen it in San Francisco as well as a counterpoint mm. uh, mm -hmm. to see what the, what the container produces in relationship to the object and the project. Mm -hmm. totally. <laughs> I was just wondering where we are supposed to sit <laughs> you know, I think with this work for for me, it's the scale. It's it's the scale of the it's the scale of the lost kind of the lost dream. You know that these are houses that um, were unrealized, and so in each of them are kind of encoded. You know some some set of dreams and failures and kind of loss and um, we can't know in a way why these houses were unrealized um, but they 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 sit as sort of mementos to that you know to that failure or um, perhaps they realized a better house I don't know <laughs> um, you know I, I think it's it as an urban plan as a as a kind of plan set, um, or as as a design of a neighborhood, it has a it, it has a, um, a quality that we it doesn't quite come together. It's it's um, they're from slightly different eras, different sensibilities, and yet when they attempt to arrive together as a place, it's there's a certain uncanny um, sort of unfamiliarity. To, the, to that place. Mm -hmm. But they were all designed in the same period, right? The original they were designed, plans. Yeah, they were designed between 1920 and 1930. Mm -hmm. But architecture in Iceland at that time, it's really, this is the first generation of Icelandic architects, and it is very kind of generative of kind of everything that has happened before, you mm -hmm. could say, in architecture because it's really the first. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say perhaps that they are, you know, um, anyway, I mean, they're, they're sort of, you know, maybe reflective of sort mm -hmm. of, um, you know, early sort of post-ornamental mm -hmm. uh, architecture to Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're sort of in terms of like architectural history, they're a little bit all over the map, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It feels a little bit like Houston. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Houston is a city with no zoning. Uh -huh. So you get these wild mixes of, you know, very small scale, sort of modest vernacular homes mm -hmm. next to a kind of, you know, this wild mansion and formation mm -hmm. that is out of scale and out of context. Um, I've been spending some time in the Middle East and there, in, in certain countries, there's a different relationship to financing and mortgages. So you basically have a scenario where um, houses are built incrementally. So you might build the superstructure or you might build the foundation. Oh, um, and it's, it sort of proceeds as cash is available. 
So can you imagine, I mean, there's an entire city where you have um, a kind of extraordinary palace next to a, a house that looks like that um, with a huge gaping hole inside. So it's, it's uh, our sense of a place is also a construct of, of culture mm -hmm. and of economics and of a, a certain way that a city is born. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but what an interesting moment that you curated and selected to draw from because it's a, an architectural moment that wants to obliterate all of that detailing mm -hmm. and no longer feels comfortable looking at the past. And yet you've drawn and illustrated that there's a um, fictionalized memory of what uh, past ornament and cornucopia of stylistic possibilities might produce in a profoundly modern turn uh, in history. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I think of I think of the architectural plan or the architectural design. These drawings, I mean, they are looking. They're very much, and I, I think this is to my sort of artist's understanding or my artist reading of architecture. Architecture is always very much about drawing into the future. You know? And um, so there's this kind of like optimism and potentiality mm -hmm. of the building that's going to be built and the life that is going to be lived in it. And the family, they're, they're, res they're all residential buildings. And then, you know, in some ways, like the action that I have taken with it is kind of becomes, makes these objects kind of as evidences of a past action, which is a destructive action, you could say, or an action that is sort of, in terms of its value, uh, codified very differently. So it's this, and, you know, what you were saying about the, this, um, yeah, how, um, yeah, anyway, I mean, I think it's just, um, there's this kind of um, paradox in them, I think, mm -hmm. um, which somehow sits together. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just, just to the point of the plan, um, for me, you know, usually when I'm, when I show these miniature objects, I have like a whole bunch of work that I've made that deals very specifically with, you know, trying to erase this line between different scales in space. So the, the miniature is not seen in a different kind of zone as the, as the human body or the architecture. So to put these works on a pedestal is in, so, in a certain way, uh, you know, a little bit veering away from from that, the object itself, as you as you were saying, it 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 kind of test is a testament to existing in actual space by having been broken. You kind of see the contact of real space to the to the objects, but the um, when I've shown them before, I've shown them shown them also on a pedestal, on a low pedestal, but the houses have been sitting directly on it. And here I've decided to raise them a little bit. And I think, you know, what you were saying about like the relationships between houses in, in zoning and in, in, in an urban plan, there's something that happens with the way that they're shown here that, you know, they kind of, there's a relationship that is created between them, but because there isn't like a, just a flat space that kind of brings them together, that holds them together, that becomes a little bit more sort of um, open to interpretation. So you can, you kind of have this opportunity to read them as, you know, as a, as a village mm -hmm. that, you know, de depending on, you know, how you, how you look at them, you might see them as being very related or very unrelated. Mm -hmm. So, um, or you can also just see them as this kind of like floating in no space, you know, mm -hmm. kind of as a constellation, you know, in the sky or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and going back to the, the intentionality, I mean, 
the, this display is highly detailed. I mean, the work and the thought that went into it. I mean, as with all of your work, it was incredibly fastidious. It's meticulous. Uh, there's a half inch nearly around <laughs> every single one of those sculptures. So the base, each of those bases is designed specifically for each one of those sculptures. Um, and then that, those boxes are on the subway platform that is designed specifically for that room and <laughs> our adherence to ADA policies so that people can actually <laughs> navigate the space. Right. But, um, but everything is tailored, like everything is tailored to that room and then the sculptures are tailored to that platform and everything is kind of, uh, yeah, tailored to each other. So um, just to point that out, I, it's, a, it's an incredible feat that is maybe something that would be overlooked or because it seems so natural to the sculptures that it might be easily overlooked, but it's incredibly well thought out and um, as yeah. it should be. As it should be, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, just, just one comment on that, which is that I, I think that um, often my work, especially when it comes to the installation of the work, mm -hmm is to make things disappear as opposed to make things seen. So, you know, especially like in the presentation of work, you know, to, to set things up in such a way that, you know, there isn't any, like, there isn't any aggregate in the visual field mm -hmm. that kind of, that your eye kind of gets stuck on, right. you know? And so sometimes there's a lot of time that goes, a lot of time and effort that goes into kind of going with this kind of figurative eraser mm -hmm. over the space to, to kind of quiet it down so <coughs> that, you know, your attention is not uh, interrupted, which is in a way, um, you know, like it's, it's uh, paradoxical or, or the opposite really of, <laughs> of thinking of like trying to show the space like honestly and truly and mm -hmm. making you feel like you are really in the space. It's, mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit of a yeah. balancing move. But I've, I've noticed that often, you know, in these like, you know, exhaustive weeks before an installation, <laughs> like when you're like, <laughs> you know, yeah, with that eraser, just like getting everything out. You know? mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I want to make sure that we have time to talk about also this last project, but also the kind of this larger idea around cycles of change and transformation, which really, you know, this work also speaks to the umbilical resonances and metamorphic as well. Um, you know, many of your projects um, combine both personal histories as well as broader social and political and economic histories that you know, both this micro scale and this macro scale or these pers different perspectives. Um, and I've also, you know, in the brochure for the, for the exhibition, which I hope everyone has and, or doesn't, if you don't have it, please pick it up before you leave. Um, your practice is an archeological practice. Um, and this is intended both figuratively and literally to a certain degree. Uh, so thinking about this relationship between the personal and broader social collectivity uh, and the ways that the personal is also shaped by the political and economic as well, uh, I'm interested to hear how you weave together these different strands, these different narrative strands, uh, and, and perhaps also specifically in relationship to the project Namesake. Yeah. Yeah, so Namesake, just to talk a little bit about, you know, give, give kind of the premise of that, mm -hmm. what that work is. You know, the simplest way to say it is that I dug a hole in Iceland and I took some dirt out of the hole and I shipped it to my studio and mm -hmm. I, you know, filtered it and purified it and then, kept, you know, ended up with, you know, usable clay, mm -hmm. the, this original sculpting material, this, the original material of, um, you know, to form with. And I formed it by hand into these little paving stones. And then I take them and I put them, you know, in a hole in the ground in Lansing, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very simple idea. And in the, in, in the process, you know, I take a photograph of these 
little paving stones, which is on the hall, uh, on the wall here mm -hmm. in the hallway, and um, and this material, uh, you know, it's a material that uh, it's earth itself. It's the kind of eternal material. It's material that has a totally different sense of that, you know, exists in a different um, span of time mm -hmm. from the human life, mm -hmm. um, and to kind of capture my activity and my intention and my activity in a photograph mm -hmm. is really a way to speak about the, you know, the minute mm -hmm. um, span of time that the human life is. And also, you know, I should say that there's something um, I have, um, I had an opportunity to do a work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 2010. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm a contemporary artist making work that deals with history, yes, but, you know, kind of within this museum where I'm in a context of, you know, thousands of, of uh, you know, mm -hmm. a very different time span and looking at objects that are so old and you know, you really kind of, it puts everything in perspective in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, and I be, I've become more and more sort of acutely aware of the, just the limited, um, mm -hmm. the, the limits of this reality that I live in and how as a human being I'm like, I'm perceiving, I'm perceiving these, you know, incredible spans of time mm -hmm. but I myself and my creation is mm -hmm. so minute in that and mm -hmm. so the project in many ways is about that and the photograph is there sort of as a you know what remains from that in its in the form that I've given it mm -hmm. but then the clay as it goes into the ground because the clay is not fired by now um, if you go to this beautiful site by the Grand River, you are not even going to see the patterns that you see here because the clay has completely assimilated and it's just taken on the form that it was in more or less in the earth in Iceland. So it was sort of disturbed there for a moment and now it's, <laughs> now it's back in its, you know, uh, in its form that is not, um, you know, nature has sort of put it back in its in the form that nature wants it to be in, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and clay, of course, is, um, you know, it's a very old metaphor for, you know, for the human body. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and of course, you know, coming off the earth and going into the earth is, is another metaphor from, from the same book, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, there's, there is maybe an anthropological aspect to mm -hmm. most of my works, mm -hmm. you know, and then this one maybe is a little bit, you know, it's, it's a little bit sort of more abstracted or stripped down than mm -hmm. some of the other. There aren't any other people in it, <laughs> you know, like in the, with the architecture and the furniture. Yeah. Sense. Yeah. Um, you know, we've talked too about, you know, obviously this idea of transference or kind of migration and, and soil is also something that is often tied to identity as well right your kind of native soil or your homeland is often described as being you know is kind of embedded in this idea of a soil um, so I think there's also this kind of in as one moves through life and also kind of migrates immigrates um, you know you recently became a US citizen you know there's there is this, sorry, <laughs> hopefully that's not too much personal information, but, um, you know, but it is also about this idea of finding home and, and maybe both that home is where you're from, but also where you are now. It's a place that you can also carry with you. And so, you know, the way that this work um, truly assimilates into its context, I think is really, I mean, very beautiful, but also I think very meaningful. There's a lot of, a lot of metaphorical, um, lessons or yeah, values mm -hmm. to be taken from this work? Yeah, I mean, I think both, both this work and Metamorphic are both kind of dealing with, you know, uh, 
with migration in a certain way. Like, mm -hmm. and I, when I use that word, I mean it in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. But this work specifically, I think, also uh, just puts the question. I mean, not only it's not only about like Earth itself crossing a border, but then mm -hmm. it also kind of points to this you know, um, kind of uh, questionable underpinnings of drawing a map mm. and calling Earth on one side of the map something different than you call it on the other side of the map. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in a certain way, like I'm somebody, my, my, every, all my practice is, is very, very based in drawing. Drawing is really like where everything begins with mm -hmm. me. And, you know, uh, geography and cartography mm -hmm. is also uh, uh, a form of spatial record and of spatial and of drawing, you mm -hmm. know. And so it is, um, there's a lot of implications to it, you know. There's uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of implications to it. And, you know, to call Earth on one side of a border something different from on the other is it becomes also kind of. And, you know, there are so many, you know, issues that we're seeing today that kind of stem from this, you know, stem from how these lines are drawn, you know. Absolutely. But, um, yeah. So I wanted to give uh, Hasin and Anya also an opportunity. I mean, you both work in the public realm as well, public space. This is really a public project that also has a component that's here in the museum, as Sis Ketcher mentioned with the photograph. Um, but I'd like to open it up to hear your thoughts uh, on working in the public realm and the kind of implications of doing so. Also, you know, thinking about change and transformation um, and these questions of permanence and impermanence um, and how they relate to, to that work in the public domain. So if one of you cares to <laughs> dive in. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a super interesting question. You know, I, I think for me, working in a in a public context is it's really about trying to create the broadest possible platform from which artists can work mm. um, and trying to expand the agency that artists might have beyond the gallery space i think that's probably rooted in a in like one a belief in artists and a belief in what artists can can do for our world but also a belief that um there's not many other effective ways to actually transform our public life. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't trust politicians. I don't trust, um, don't trust civic leaders too often. You know, don't trust university leaders. <laughs> um, who can we trust? I think artists are to be trusted. And when we give artists a real platform, mm -hmm. they can do something new for public life, mm. for our cities, for places, mm -hmm. um, in a way that's, that's meaningful and mm. powerful. So even if it's <clears throat> as kind of subtle as reminding us, you know, from the earth we come, I don't know what the <laughs> phrase is, <laughs> from whence we came. Yeah. Dust to dust, basically. Dust to dust, yeah. If it's as subtle as that, or if it's if it's about um, societal transformation, mm -hmm. giving artists that platform is is the first step. Mm. Yeah. I don't know if I can follow up with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, for for me, the the work in the public realm has always been. Um, perpetual conflict and struggle between erasure and monumentalization of something. And, you know, uh, when I first came to Michigan 10 years ago and I witnessed Detroit as a public realm, as an expression of culture and ideology and politics and redlining mm -hmm. and what had happened there, I was struck that in this country there, there could be this level of erasure. Mm. Um, and it reminded me of, you know, 
where I come from, which is I'm, I'm a Soviet. And so, you know, when we don't like something, we usually put a parking lot over a cemetery or something like that. We do, we do rude iconoclastic things. <laughs> um, and so my, my first instinct uh, working in these places of perpetual reconstruction and erasure was to build temporary monuments mm -hmm. to some story about what was happening there. And so, uh, and it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, but uh, when I see a project like this that self-consciously deals with the trauma of perpetual reconstruction and erasure and uh, helps us deal with the consequences in a shortened span of time, it's both uh, transgressive and liberating um, to, to see a, a work of art that handles it with such subtlety and uh, intentionality. So, um, kudos. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I would say one more thing, and I, and I think this carries, for me at least, through all of the work, is that I think there's a certain amount of withholding. Mm -hmm. You you often don't tell us the the full story, <laughs> um, but that that means that it's it's about what we bring to the work. It's mm -hmm. it's not encoded with a a hard narrative or a, a hard meaning. It's the work is open and it's it it gives so much space for us to to bring our own experiences and beliefs and um, kind of aspirations into our understanding of the work. And for me, that's, that's the power. Um, we're given just enough to, to try to, to kind of latch in. Um, but that openness is, is where the meaning accrues. Yeah, that's, uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that reading of the work. I think um, I, I don't go through the process of, of sort of sorting out what I want to expose and what mm -hmm. not, but I do think that, I mean, um, and I don't actually think that, um, I mean, you use the word withholding, but I don't, um, I don't feel that I hold anything back, per se, but I think that perhaps the work, um, you know, sometimes, I mean, if the work kind of evokes that level of, you know, intrigue or curiosity, then I'm hoping that it's actually sort of um, evoking in the viewer um, a beginning of some story, which might seem to be my story, maybe it isn't my story, you know, but um, in, maybe it is my story, or maybe it's not, but, um, but in the end, you know, the work, the work is just itself, and, um, and, and the work in some ways just becomes a container for, you know, meaning for that, um, where I might be seen, either me or Reykjavik or Iceland, or you know, the earth in Iceland, might be seen as the protagonist. But you know, this also gets back to a very important um, part of uh, my work, which is that you know, I I always choose to kind of use my um, you know use my own experiences or my own history. Mm -hmm my categorical history, like those houses in Reykjavik that I've never seen and I've not lived in, but, you know, mm -hmm. are drawn in the city that I'm from, um, as, a, you know, kind of as the building blocks for the work. And I, I like to talk about that as being my, being my way of sort of just using and using something that is authentic to me, that has truth to me, but in some ways, maybe it really isn't about that. I mean, mm. and, and it kind of brings me back to where I began, which is, you know, it's really about, for me, it's about the construction of the past, 
something that is remembered. And, you know, I was talking to someone earlier who was very interested in, you know, looking at art from Iceland. And, you know, I said, you know, in one way, the show is all about Iceland. It's all about me and my story. But in another way, it's not. It's mm -hmm. just about memory. And uh, it's about these sort of monuments, you know, or these forms from memory that then come to be sort of um, activated or filled with, you know, experiences that come from within each, each of us, I hope. That's mm -hmm. what I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a beautiful way to end this conversation. I just want to say thank you again to all of you veterans for sharing your work with us, and all the work you've done to make this exhibition, and Anya and Hesse for joining us as well. So thank you very much. Thank you.